Um, I've said hello to the people who are here, but hello as well to those of you who are watching uh, on the video. Um, welcome to semester two, uh, 2020. Um, and because it's 2020, uh, here I am in um, my house um, doing this via Zoom uh, rather than in a lecture theatre. Um, yes, it's revision seminar for Maths 1M, and uh, I will be mostly working on the document camera. Uh, and um, we're talking through with what, whatever people request. <coughs> so um, it's going to be a random collection of stuff, and we'll see what we can get to. All right. So um, the first request I've had uh, is to uh, have a chat about um, cross and dot products. Um, and it'd be really good if I could have a look at what the lecture notes say. So um, if somebody has um, the piece of the lecture notes that, that is about on their screen and is we willing to share it, then, um, you know, tell me in the chat that you want to do that and I'll stop sharing so that you can share your own screen because um, I don't have access to those lecture notes because um, I'm not part of the teaching um, my job is to help everyone learn all the maths everywhere in the uni, and, and that means I'm not necessarily part of the my uni course you're doing. So if you are happy to share, then please let me know in the chat that you're happy to. Otherwise, I can just make it up. Okay, that's fine. Um, unless an email has come in. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the cross product and the dot product. So we're talking vectors here um, and vectors in 3D. So um, back in the day, I'm just going to give you some, yeah, emailing them to me would be would be very helpful, actually. Thank you. Um, back in the, I will just, you know, do, do some waffling for a bit. Back in the day, um, in about the 1630s, um, people were, you know, having a really great time with complex numbers. Um, and they discovered some, some, Great things. Yes, email out to the Math Learning Center email. That'd be great. They were doing, discovering some really great things about complex numbers um, and how um, complex numbers allowed them to treat points in a plane as as numbers that you could multiply and add. And they discovered that that multiplying complex numbers allowed them to talk about both stretching, which is what multiplying by real numbers does, and rotating, which is a whole new thing. Um, and so. I'm really excited by this. Um, in the 1650s, Hamilton was saying, oh, maybe we could try and do this in 3D. That'd be awesome. Um, and he discovered this thing called the quaternions, <clears throat> which didn't actually work in 3D. It was actually in four dimensions. But then people later in, in, in the 1670s, um, discovered that they actually could use this quaternion thing um, in 3D after all by creating this thing that they call vectors. Um, and vectors weren't really a thing until about then. Um, and then they were able to create all this cool vector calculus stuff um, that you guys haven't learned in Maths 1M. Um, but if you keep doing maths, you might learn more about it um, in second year um, or even in Maths 1B if you get to there. Um, and it was great. And so the complex numbers uh, causes... Um, Complex numbers uh, uh, and the, the rotation and that sort of thing from there eventually allowed us to get to this point of having a cross product and a dot product. So with the complex numbers, you can times two complex numbers together and you can get a complex number. 
And you can also do this thing where you where you um, find the length from a complex number, which turns a complex number into a real number. Um, and so they managed to try and find a way of multiplying vectors together as well, but there were some annoying little quirks that don't happen with complex numbers. Um, yeah. So um, annoying little quirks that don't happen with complex numbers. Because if you multiply two complex numbers, what you always get is another complex number. But what they discovered was that sometimes if you multiply vectors together, you get a vector. And sometimes if you multiply vectors together, you get um, a number. Um, and so there are, in the end, two different kinds of multiplications for vectors. So that's the idea. And the only way to make multiplication work for vectors is to have two different kinds of multiplication. And so what they invented was a notation. Knowing that we've got lots of different ways to write multiplication, they use two different symbols for the two different kinds of multiplication. And so they have uh, vector cross vector, and it produced a vector as an answer. And vector dot vector and it produced a number as the answer. So um, I have no idea why they chose the two numbers that they, the two symbols that they did, why the cross and why the dot. Um, but all I can say to you um, <clears throat> is that a vector is something that exists um, in space and you need the coordinate axes in order to find it. And this little cross looks a little bit like a pair of coordinate axes. Whereas the numbers, a number is, is just a dot on the number line. Um, and so this dot is shaped the way a number is shaped. That's how I think about it. Um, and so that may help you remember if you have trouble remembering which is which. Um, if you know that sort of vectors in some sense are small, numbers in some sense are smaller than vectors. So the symbol that you use for the number, pro the product that produces a number is smaller than the symbol that produces the, um, the vector. Awesome. I'm just having a look at the lecture notes now um, to see what your lecturer says about it. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so this is what your lecture notes say about the dot product. Um, they say that um, if you have two vectors um, with an angle between them, so we're thinking of our vectors as arrows, then you can calculate the dot product from the uh, two lengths of the vectors here times cosine of the angle between them. And that's what the dot product is defined to be in your course. Okay, but it is useful to know that the dot product is also found by multiplying the matching entries of your vectors and adding them up. So when I look at this, the x1 and the x2 end up here. The y1 and the y2 end up here. The z1 and the z2 end up here. And then I have to add the three things together. That's how to do a dot product with actual coordinates. But if all you have is information about how long the vectors and the directions they're pointing, then you can use this formula here. 
But the important thing about the dot product is that it produces always a number from your two vectors. And that number is related to how long the vectors are and the angle between them. Cool, I'm going to stop sharing that for a second. I'm just going to write some of that down. So for the dot product, this one here. Um, for two numbers. And what that will mean is it will multiply the three and the one. We'll multiply the five and the zero. We'll multiply the seven and the minus six. And we'll add the three answers together. And so I'll get three plus zero minus 42, which is minus 39. Cool. Or if we had uh, u has length five, phi has length uh, three, and angle between is 60 degrees, then um, the dot product of u and v will be 5 times 3 times cos of 60 degrees, which is pi on 3. Cos of 60 degrees, which would be 5 times 3 times a half, which is whatever 15 on 2 is, so, you know, which is actually equal to 7.5. So what will happen with the dot products is that the longer your vectors are, the bigger the answer will be for the dot product. Um, so if you have two vectors that are like this, then maybe the dot product um, will come out to six. But then if you made this vector longer, it will make the dot product bigger and bigger and bigger. And if you make this vector longer, it will make the dot product bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So the dot product will get long, get larger and larger. The longer these vectors are, when I say bigger, I mean further away from zero. And if you have two vectors the same length and you change the angle between them, then the closer they are to each other, the bigger the dot product is going to get. Or when they're so as this vector here we go as this vector moves towards this vector the dot product is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until it gets the biggest it can possibly be and then the dot product is going to get smaller and smaller again it's going to get smaller and smaller until it gets to there where the dot product is zero and then it'll start being small lower and lower but negative and so the size of the number will get bigger and bigger until it's the biggest negative number it can be and then it'll get closer and closer to zero again so the dot product will be is the size of the dot product um, is related to um, how long the vectors are and how and how much they're sort of pointing in the same direction if they're pointing generally in the same direction the dot product will be positive if they're pointing generally in the opposite direction the dot product will be negative and if they're if they're pointing at right angles to each other the dot product will be zero that's the dot product now how do people feel about all of that, about the dot product? You can either um, say something in the chat or stick a thumbs up sign or a thumbs down sign. Just want to know how you feel or ask a question. Okay, that's the dot product. Cross product is a whole other thing. The cross product is designed to produce a vector when you take two vectors and you do this product. I'm not going to be able to fit it on this page, but I can fit it on a new page. Cross product. <clears throat> when it was first invented, was done using the coordinates of the vectors. So um, it goes, which is best to do as an example, 
actually just let me have a look at your lecture notes and say what it says. Oh, there are all sorts of things I could say. I'm just, just going to stop you for a second. There are all sorts of things you can say about the dot product. Um, and once you know anything that you want to do with vectors, you want to know how they're related to each other. And so, for example, I want to know that how does the dot product interact with addition? And it can expand out over addition the same as with ordinary multiplication does with numbers. Where'd my chat go? I can't see my chat. There it is. Oh. Um, so, Ben, you're asking, is there chat happening directly the rest of us aren't, aren't seeing? Um, people can chat to me directly privately, but no, it's not happening. That's just when they're saying thanks to me um, or um, asking me how they can send me stuff. Um, you should be able to, if you have a chat, um, select who the chat is being sent to. Okay. Right. Cross product, here it is. Here's how to calculate the cross product here. Um, and that looks quite complicated. Um, and I have a way of setting it up so it's easier for me to process. So um, I'm going to do that. Good, I just wanted to see how it was done. So the cross product goes, and it's just easier to do with, um, um, I'll do the same, how about I do the same vectors that I did before? So this is how I do it. So the working I do is I put the vectors on top of each other. And you have to put the first vector at the top and the second vector at the bottom, because the answer will be different if you do it in a different order. Um, and then I do this um, with the first two coordinates and this with the second, uh, with the last two coordinates and this uh, with the first and last coordinates. And that's how I do the dot product. I'm just going to spread that out and use something to just help you figure out what I'm doing there. Let me get a tool here. So one reason I call it the cross product is because I do all these crosses. I just need... Uh, this. So I'm going to take these two. I'm not going to start there. So the first coordinate of the dot product is made by the other two coordinates of the vectors. And I'm going to do 5 times minus 6. And I'm going to subtract the 0 times 7. That's what's in the first coordinate. And the second coordinate is going to be made by the positions of, that's the wrong texture. Second coordinate is going to be made by the other positions. Don't use the second, the second coordinate. The answer is made from the first and third coordinates of the inputs. And the second coordinate is going to be three times minus six minus one times seven only um, because, well, because reasons, it has to be minus this answer, the middle one. Um, because that cross crosses over the middle one, um, basically. And then the third coordinate is made from the first two coordinates of the input. So the third coordinate is made from these two. It'll be 3 times 0 minus 1 times 5. And that's the way it's done. And so I get minus 30 as the first coordinate, minus... Uh, 
minus 18 minus 7 in the second coordinate and minus 5 in the third coordinate. And, and that's the cross product. I'm just going to do another one just to make sure we know the deal here. There we go, let's do that one. So this cross product, I'm just going to write these over here. One's a half. Okay, so the first coordinate's going to be made from these things, going to be a half times three, a half times three, which is one and a half, minus, minus two times six, which is plus 12. So 12 plus three on two would be 20, 27 on two. And then I'm going to do minus three, minus 12, which is minus 15. Uh, but then I have to minus that answer in the middle here. And then I'm going to do um, for the last one, I'm going to use the first two. Uh, minus one times minus two is plus two, minus two times a half. So plus two minus one, and I get a one. That's how to do the cross product. So just to clarify, this last one came about by doing a half that cross. That's the first one. The second one came about from doing this cross, but it was minus that. And then the last one came about by doing this cross. How are people feeling about the calculation of the cross product there? was sent to me privately and we had someone saying that's great thanks <laughs> so um the only other thing is that the dot product had a geometry thing where it was based on the um length of the vectors and the angle between them cost product does that as well so the way the cross product is related to the length of the vectors and the angle between them is that um the cross product has a length because it's a vector and it has an ang um, and it has a direction as well. So if you have u and v, then the length of u cross v. Does your lecture use double bars for length? Yes, the length of u cross v is the same as the length of u times the length of v times sine of the angle between. Uh, and the direction of u cross v is perpendicular to both u and v. And um, there are two directions that are perpendicular to two vectors. If I drew um, in space this vector and this vector just here, then this direction this way is perpendicular to both and this direction this way is perpendicular to both. Um, and what you have to do is um, decide which direction that's going to be. It can't be both, it has to be one. Uh, and most people use that with the right hand rule. You arrange it so that if this was the x-axis and this was the y-axis, then the answer would point in the direction of the z-axis. So I do the right hand rule like this. I have to take my right hand, which is not always easy for me to tell. Luckily I'm married, so I can tell that the ring thing is on the opposite hand. I arrange the first vector to point where my thumb is. My fingers are going to point in the direction of the second vector. And the answer is going to point out of my palm. 
so it's like that now and therefore that direction out of my palm is going to be the direction that the cross product points. And choose using the right hand rule. The reason we do the right hand rule is so that um, when you cross product the coordinate axes with each other, you get the other coordinate axes. So you have, if you have the x axis, the y axis, and the z axis, then you're going to get that um, a vector pointing along the x axis crossed with a vector pointing along the y axis is going to produce the z axis. That's how that works. And um, if I use my right hand rule on my x, y, z axes, that's good. Uh, y cross z. is x, yep, and z cross x is y. Oh, sorry. Done that wrong, that's that way. So most people call the vector on this axis i and the vector on this axis j and the vector on this axis k. And you've got i cross j is k, j cross k is i, and k cross i is j. Yeah. So just so you know, um, they are specifically chosen so that the the that the x axis cross the y axis is the z axis. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, thoughts about the cross product. Okay. Right. Well, they're the, the basic details. There are some rules that the cross product and the dot product satisfy um, in terms of being able to expand out brackets and that sort of thing. Um, we can talk about them if you want me to, but so feel free to interrupt me if you do. But otherwise, I'm going to go back and um, choose some things that people had um, talked about. All right, someone has asked me about um, this limit. And asked me why does it come out to the answer sine of x? and not zero. So the first answer to that is that the limit of this is one. And that's what we really want to know. We want to know why is that limit one and not zero? Okay. So limits are weird things. They um, they are all about what this answer is close to when this input is close to that input. So we don't technically care about what happens exactly when h is zero, but only what happens when h is very close to zero. Now it is totally true that when h is zero, that sine of zero is zero. That's true. Um, but 
the problem is that sine of zero divided by zero doesn't mean anything. Um, like zero divided by zero could be anything because um, um, zero divided by zero could be anything because um, zero times zero is always zero. So if division, like when I ask this question, six divided by two, one way of thinking about that is to ask myself, what number do I multiply two by to get six? They're the same question. So if I'm asking zero divided by zero, that would be saying, what number do I multiply zero by to get zero? And the answer is every number. So this could be anything, and I don't know. But what I do know is that sine of number extremely close to zero divided by number extremely close to zero um, is extremely close to one. Sorry, like that. And so if these two both simultaneously get close to zero, then the answer will get close to one. And this is called the fundamental trigonometric limit um, that sine h divided by h, if h is very close to zero and you do sine of very close to zero divided by the same number that's very close to zero, the answer will be very close to one. And what this is telling me is that sine h is almost the same length as the actual value of h um, when h is really small. So I'm going to draw a little picture of the unit circle. Actually, so this is the unit circle here. And if h is an angle, then sine of h is the height um, of that point. So if I zoom right into that, the little magnifying glass just here. So there's my magnifying glass. It's zoomed in very close. And here's the edge of my unit circle. And here's my angle H. Oh, I'll do it. Yeah, here's my angle H. And here is sine of H, which is the height of that. Sine of H is almost exactly the same length as H. H is just a little bit longer um, because um, it's part of a circle instead of a straight line. Um, but they're almost the same length. And so this is saying that when H is small, then sine of H is approximately the same length as H. And so therefore sine of H divided by H is approximately equal to one. How do you feel about that? You're welcome. Um, I didn't know that, understand that particular description when I first learnt it. Um, and I can't remember who told me now, but some teacher, and I thought it was very useful at the time. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's the fundamental trig limit. So anytime you're doing limits that involve trigonometry, um, it's useful to try and arrange there to be a sine x over x in there if you're going towards zero. Does anyone have any questions that are relating to limits that they're interested in asking that, that what we've talked about has made them think about? something. Okay. Well, that's fine. Um, cool. I'm just going to scroll through and see there were some other questions. Okay. So, 
the next question I've been asked was about um, Euler's method. And a lot of people pronounce his name uh, Euler, um, but he pronounced his own name Euler, so um, that's how we're, I'm going to pronounce it. It's usually best to try and pronounce people's names the way they prefer them to be said. Um, yeah. So Euler's method is a way of not solving a differential equation. So let's see, it's part of the differential equations bit of the course. Um, and I'm just going to... Uh, turn off the sharing here and have a look at your lecture notes. So I've just searched for Euler's method. Um, all right. So, um, Euler's method is part of the differential equations bit of the course. Um, am I sharing that? I'm so not sharing that, am I? Sorry. Euler's method is part of the differential equations bit of the course. Um, differential equations, and here we are in Euler's method. Um, and it's a way of not solving a differential equation. So um, a differential equation has the tendency to look like something that's got a derivative in it equal to something involving the original function. Um, and that's not very obvious there, so I'm just going to stop that and go back to my document camera. So the idea is that it's Euler's method is designed specifically for one particular kind of differential equation. And it's a particular kind of differential equation that goes dy on dx or df on dt or d, d capital T on dt. doesn't matter what it is, but it's a differential equation with an output variable and an input variable. And this has to be something involving y's and x's. Now, they don't have to be both y's and x's. It's allowed to be just y's or just x's. Um, but if it's just X's, you should be able to solve this without using Euler's method. So it's designed for this. Now, you have seen some differential equations um, that are like this that you've been able to do without using Euler's method, and they're separable. But Euler's method is a way of not going about solving that and just figuring out a specific answer for Y that goes with a specific answer for X. But you have to have some starting information plus the information that y at a particular value of x, say 0, um, is an answer. So it'll look something like y of a equals b, something like that. Okay, and what it does is it allows you to find an approximate answer. I'm just going to call this uh, capital A, that's okay, um, for y of some other number. Okay, so... Um, it doesn't give you a formula for what y is for every x. It just gives you a way of approximating what y is for one specific x. So let me talk about just, I know setting up the table is important, but I just want to talk about the general idea, um, is that um, these are the values of x. Oh, hello, Tabitha. <laughs> That's my cat, Tabitha. These are the values of x and these are the values of y. And if there is a function where y is, a, y is related to x, it'll be, you know, somewhere in there, but we don't know what it is. But what this formula says is that wherever this function happens to be, and I don't know, but wherever it happens to be, every point that has an x-coordinate and a y-coordinate, I can sub it into this formula and it will tell me the slope. And so I can tell at every point what the slope is going to be by subbing it into the formula. And so even though I don't know where the function actually is, I do know what its slope is if I did know where it was. And so we're saying that here at A, the answer is like capital A, and here at B, we want to know what the answer is. And so we're going to follow the slope along until we get to an answer for B. That's the idea for Euler's method. And it uses something very important about how tangents work, it says that if we have a function um, and we know what its derivative is at a particular spot, then if we zoom way, way in, there's my magnifying glass and there's my function, 
then the derivative um, is the slope of this line that the function looks like it is. If I zoom out a little bit, then my function probably, you can see the curve of your function. But this line is going to be, if I'm very close, is going to be very close to my function. And so what I need to do is I need to create a line that passes through this point. And it has slope equal to the derivative, dy and dx. And if you follow a line like this, it starts at whatever the y value is which in this case is A, um, and every time you move across, it adds a little bit um, to um, the height. And the little bit that it adds is the slope times the height because that's how slope works. If you go across H, it'll be slope times H. And so the idea is that the straight line that approximates this function is going to be the new value of Y is the old value of Y, plus the slope times the distance that you moved. And so Euler's method is based on this, that the new y is the old y plus h times the old value of dy on dx at the old point. That's how I think of it in my head. And so if you had something that went something like that, 0.3y squared minus xy on 4, something stupid, um, then this would be telling you, given the value of x and y, I know what the derivative is. And it also said that y of 1 was equal to um, 3.2, maybe. Find y of 2 um, in, say, three, mm, four steps I'll do. That's a classic Euler's method problem. So um, this would require me to create um, a list of values of things. Now, I've been specifically asked to set this up in a table, but I don't actually know how that table is set up in the notes. Um, and you don't have to use the table that the lecturer uses. Uh, you can use whatever table you like. Um, so I normally have a few extra things um, in uh, the table compared to what the lecturer has. So I'm going to put them in anyway. So the idea is that we know that when x is 1, y is 3.2. Um, and we know what dy on dx is um, at those points. It will be 0 0.3 times 1 squared minus 1 times 3.2 divided by 4, which is whatever answer it is. minus 0 0.5. Okay. And then the amount that Y is going to change, um, this thing here is the change in Y. That's what I like to call it. The old Y plus the change in Y is the new Y. The amount that Y changes is the dy on dx times the H. Now, I haven't actually figured out what the H is yet. If we're going to take four steps to get from one to two, then the journey from one to two, there's one, there's two, has to be cut into four pieces. So that journey is one divided by four, which is 0 0.25. So the change in Y is going to be um, 0 0.5 times 0 0.25. minus 0 0.125. And so my new y is going to be the old y plus the change in y. Sorry about 
um, writing my table over itself. So the new y is going to be the old y, which was 3.2, plus the change in y, which was minus 0.125. Three point zero seven five. Okay, and then we can move over to the next step. One point two five is what the new x is. The new y we've just calculated is three point zero seven five, and then the dy on dx can be calculated. It will be zero point three times um, zero point no. Oh poo. This is wrong. I'm going to put it. I was using that differential equation instead. Sorry about that. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I put the value of x in this position here, not the value of y. That should have been a 3.2 squared. So I'm just going to um, change the question, uh, which is not really acceptable in your exam. So when I do that calculation, uh, 0 0.3 times 1.25 squared uh, minus 1.25 times 3.075 divided by 4 minus 0 0.492, three decimal places. And then the change in y is minus 0 0.5 times 0 point, minus 0 0.492, which is plus... 0.246. And so my new y is the old y, which is 3.075 uh, plus 0 0.246, which is whatever it is. Um, and then I'll keep doing that same process until I get to the end. So, um, my next row of my table will have 1.5 and 3.321 uh, and then I'll do this calculation and this calculation and this calculation and then this number here here we are at 1.75 and this number will end up here and then I'll use these two numbers to find dy and dx. Um, and then the delta y will be this times h. And then the new y will be this plus this. And then I will finally know that at 2, the answer is this. And I can stop. I don't need to do any of these calculations because I don't need to go further than the 2 because that's what I was looking for. Right, how do we feel about that? Oh, yes, please ask a question. Trig functions and solving problems with them. Have you got anything in particular? Um, sorry, just before we do that, how do people feel about that Euler thing? Okay, so um, so Imogen, you said, did you want um, the go? You wanted to go over trig functions and solving problems with them. Um, I'm not 100% sure exactly what you're wanting to know about there. Are there any specific problems that that you are hoping to know how to do after we discuss this that you didn't know already?
Okay, cool. Okay. All right. Um, so my request is currently um, trig functions and find the exact values at the moment. And if anyone's inspired to ask anything else along the way, then feel free. So um, so um, I'm just going to talk this out. Um, all everything I can think of about finding exact values of trig functions. So the first thing we need to know about the trig functions is that there are three main trig functions, and then there are there are that's a couple of others. Um, so. Um, excuse me. <clears throat> so. Um, I like to think about the trig functions as the unit circle. And then if you put an angle, so the unit circle is designed so that it passes through these points on the X and Y axes. Uh, and um, what we do is the function that we're thinking of isn't drawn on this X and Y axis at the moment. Um, you measure an angle going anti-clockwise starting at one on the X axis. And that literal length around the circle is the angle in radians. Um, and then um, once you've got that, I'm just actually going to redraw the picture three ways. Then the height here of that point, that's sine of theta. The distance of that point from the x-axis, that's cos of theta. And the slope of that line, that's tan of theta. So um, these, if you draw a triangle that goes down to the x-axis like that, then cos is this bit, sine is this bit, and tan is the slope of that line. That's the definitions of what they are. And so if you had a large enough circle, you could just measure the appropriate lengths and it would tell you the answers. Okay. And just know that this distance here is one always. Okay, so um, if this distance is one, then sine is the up um, and cos is the base um, and tan is the slope. And if this it's over here, then the triangle actually goes down to the x-axis still. So um, they're the things I hold on to. So if I'm over here instead, Excuse me, there's just been a knock at my door. I'm just going to um, uh, pause the recording. Be back in a second. All right, I'm back. Um, if your angle is over here and produces a point around at this spot on the triangle, on, on the circle, then um, cos will be negative because it will, it's the x coordinate of this point. Uh, sine is still positive, and the tan will be negative because the slope is negative here. But we're still going, it's going to be the same sized answer as if we had used this triangle over here. So this triangle here is how we're going to get the actual answer. Okay. So what that means is that, that um, if we, there are some very, if we have a triangle that's the right shape, we can get the exact angles, uh, the exact answers for these things. So there are two triangles that I know that are helpful. So one of them is um, 
half of a square, like that. Um, and if I made a square with length one like that, then this side would be root two. And then if I shrunk this triangle so that it was the right size for a, um, to put one in this spot, these would all be one on root two. And so that's telling me that sine of this angle, 45 degrees, which is the same as pi on four, would be this up height, and that's one on root two. And cos of pi on four is this one, which would be one on root two. And tan of pi on four would be the slope of this line, which goes one up for every one across, which is one. So the other triangles I know, this one's half a square, and we also have one that's half of an equilateral triangle. So I'm going to cut this one in half and I'm going to make the shortest length that I see in this picture a one. But if that's a one, that's a two. And Pythagoras' theorem makes this a root three. Yep. Um, and so if I made it fit in the unit circle, I'd divide everything by two. Yeah. And so cos of this 60 degrees, well, sorry, pi on three would be a half. Sine of pi on three would be um, root three on two. And tan of pi on three would be the slope. So it goes root three up for every one across. So it's root three. But if my triangle was oriented um, in a different direction, um, if my triangle was oriented this way instead, then I'd be able to use the same lengths to find cos and sine and tan of um, this angle, which is pi on six. So cos of pi on six would be the root three on two. Uh, sine of pi on six uh, would be the half and tan of pi on six. Now it goes um, root three across for every one up is one on root three. So that's how I remember them. Um, yeah, so they're the basic ones. Some people, if they have enough practice, just remember these. I also have the knowledge that um, bigger angles between zero and pi on two, bigger angles produce smaller answers for cos, but bigger angles produce bigger angle, bigger answers for sine. So I can remember these, but I do have trouble remembering which goes with which. Um, but I know that if I'm thinking that cos of pi on three, it's either root three on two or a half, I know it has to be the smaller one because this is the bigger angle. So that's a corroborating factor that can help me remember it without drawing a triangle. So that's all well and good, except what if your angles and these triangles only fit here? So if I had um, something that was more like cos of, you know, seven pi on six, then um, I'd need to figure out where that is in the unit circle first. So seven pi on six is a little bit more than one whole pi. So it's about here. And in fact, it's one sixth more than one whole pi. So that's pi on six there. And so when I look at this triangle, pi on six there and one there. And I know what that is. If I have my equilateral triangle with 60 degrees here, there'll be ones and there's a one there and there's a, there's a half there. And this will be a root three on two. And so cos will be this number here. I 
only it's negative because cos is negative on this side because the x-coordinates are negative. Yeah. If you want to show some working for it, you can say that cos of 7 pi on 6 is cos of pi on 6 because we figured out this drawing that it's pi on 6 um, left over after you removed a whole pi, but it's going to be minus cos of pi on 6, and then you can do that. How do you feel about this at the moment? Some I like pretty all right. Okay. So any position around the unit circle based on the fundamental angles that fit in a square and, a, and an equilateral triangle. Any other angles that are not multiples of those things, um, we're going to have to use some various other formulas for. So there's two other situations in which I know that one could be asked to find exact answers for things. So one is when you're asked something like cos of pi on 12, which isn't any of those answers. And the only way I know to find the exact answer for cos of pi on 12 or things involving pi on 8s and stuff like that um, is to use some of the um, angle addition and subtraction formulas. So I know there's formulas that tell me how to figure out cos and sine um, of angles that have been created by adding and subtracting other angles. So if I can think of some angles that add or subtract to produce this, I'll be good. So the angles I know are pi on 2, pi on 3, pi on 4, and pi on 6. And so I need to think about how to make pi on 12 out of these. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, I could do half of pi on six. That's one thing I could do. Um, and I could also think of it as, well, a pi on a 12 on the bottom would be produced with a three and a four. And the addition and subtractions are easier to do than the half angles. So maybe I'll do that. So, um, Actually, pi on 3 is a little bit bigger than pi on 4, and so if I subtract them, I'll get a nice small number, and I reckon it's going to be pi on 12. That would be 4 pi on 12 minus 3 pi on 12, which is 1 pi on 12. Okay, so that's the same as cos of pi on 3 minus pi on 4, and the angle formula for cos goes cos of the two coses and the two sines uh, and um, cos, if there's a plus, would normally put a minus on the sines, and but it's going to be a plus in this spot here. Now, cos of pi on three. is a half and cos of pi on four is one on root two. I know that one. Okay. And sine of pi on three is root three on two and sine of pi on four is one on root two. And so I've got root three, one plus root three on two root two. And that's the answer for cos of pi on 12, uh, which is approximately just, just, just want to see if I've got it right. One plus root three. Divided by two root two. Point nine six. Okay, that's not too bad because um, 
a number, a, a really small angle for cos should produce something that's really close to one for the answer because it's the x coordinate. And so that's um, great. Um, it's almost about right. And let's just check cos minus cos of um, pi on 12. Oh, it's in gradients. We don't want that. Gradients is zero. Okay, cool. It's the right answer according to my calculator. Yeah, so that's one thing that you can do is you can use one of the angle addition and subtraction formulas to do it. Um, I could also have used a half angle formula to do it, um, like a double angle formula. So an alternative answer would have been is uh, cos of a half a pi on six. So we know that. So instead of going to halves, I could have said that cos of pi on 6 is cos of 2 times pi on 12, uh, which is double angle formula based on cos. Cos of pi on 12 squared minus sine of pi on 12 squared. That's the double angle formula for cos. But this has got two things that I don't know both of, but that's okay because sine is 1 minus cos squared. So if I sub that in, I'm going to end up with this. Like that. And so now I've got a formula that involves um, the thing I want and one thing that I do know. So I'm going to get cos of pi on 6, which we already figured out was a half. No, cos of pi on 6. Cos of pi on 6 is root 3 on 2. Squared minus 1, and now I have to rearrange this. It's not looking easy. Cos of pi on 12 squared is now root 3 on 4 plus a half and cos of pi on 12 is now the square root of root 3 on 4 plus a half. And I know it's the positive one because pi on 12 is in that first quadrant um, of the unit circle. Um, let me just check to see if that's the same answer. Square root of the square root of 3 divided by 4 plus a half minus cos of pi on 12. Yep, okay, it's the same answer. It looks totally different from the other one, but there you go, that's the way it is. Square roots can do some pretty fancy stuff. How are we feeling about that? Awesome. The very only other situation in which I know that you can be asked to find an exact answer for um, a trig thing is when you're told one of sine, sine or cos and or tan and you have to figure out the other one. So the example might go something like theta uh, is between pi and um, 2 pi uh, with cos of theta equals, no, sorry, tan of theta is um, 5 sevenths, find cos of theta. So something like that. Um, exactly. This is the only other situation I know where you're asked for exact values, but it's not quite the same as the others because you don't actually know what the angle theta is. And there's not going to be any really nice angle that produces the answer of 5 on 7 for tan. But I do know that tan is the slope. So the first information I have is that theta is between pi and 2 pi. So that means that my angle is like in this quadrant or it could be in 
this quadrant. And that's my first piece of information. And tan is positive, and tan is the slope, and the slope would be negative here or positive here, and so it must be in this quadrant here. So since tan theta is positive, theta is in the third quadrant, and in the third quadrant, cos is negative. Okay, that's a good start. All right. And the other thing is that there should be, it should match up perfectly with an angle that, that an angle that fits in a triangle um, that has these same things. So I can say something like um, that alpha be in the first quadrant with tan alpha is five sevenths. And then inside a triangle, the slope of this line is five sevenths. So it goes up five and across seven. Um, so for every seven across, it goes up five, like that. Uh, so alpha is then in this triangle. Um, the hypotenuse of this triangle is uh, the square root of 5 squared plus 7 squared. Uh, 70, root 74. It's not pretty, but there it is. Which means that sine um, would need a 1 in that spot. So what did I want? Cos. Cos would need a 1 in that spot, so I'd need to divide everything by the hypotenuse. And so cos of alpha would be um, 7 on root 74. And therefore, cos of theta is going to be the same answer as that, except cos is negative um, in the third quadrant, and so therefore cos theta is that. That's how I would figure that out. There is an alternative way to do this using trig um, identities, which I will just show you as well. Um, but before I do, um, how do you feel about that solution? Anybody? Awesome. I might leave it at that, actually. So we've come to the end of the time that I had allotted for this, so I think we might stop now. Um, does everyone have something that they feel like they've, they can take away from this that's useful for them? Good. Really glad you came and brought some things to talk about. I uh, wish you really very good luck with your exam. Um, Mass Learning Centre um, is open today and Monday and um, Tuesday and the rest of the exam period, um, both online uh, and face-to-face. -face. So if you wanted to talk about anything, please do drop in um, and have a chat about um, anything you want to talk about, um, ranging from the maths content to strategies for dealing with your exam. Good luck.